us. Um, all right, I, this is, I really struggled with this one. You can, you can ask any of the leaderships why I sent it out on Saturday night, because I'm like, I don't want this to be academic, okay? But it is going to be very academic. Um, so we're going through the Bible, right? And we're, we're stepping, this is going to encroach. Is that in the frame? Don't move it now. Is that good? Is it good now? Okay. Um, I, I, I'm going to hit it. <laughs> um, so we're going through the Bible, right? And we're, we're stepping through um, what we believe about the Bible, right? Things, words that maybe you've heard, um, but maybe you haven't really had a, a good grasp as to why we say the things that we say about the Bible, right? And so we, we saw last week, last week was the first week, and we said that the Bible is the inspired word of God. That, and that, that was based on who God is, that he is a personal God, that he wants us to know him, and therefore we conclude that he wants to reveal himself to us. And he does that through general revelation, through just the world and his creation, but also through special revelation, and that's what the Bible is. And so we read through and we're like, yes, it, it seems very clear that the Bible declares that what it includes is the words of God. Right? So that's, that was like the formation and the foundation of what we believe about the Bible and why we stand up here and talk about this every week and why you guys read it at home because we see this as God's word. This is his love letter to us, if you will, so that we understand who he is, his purpose and plan for us. This morning, my, my charge is to go through that this is authentic that this is actually what they wrote, right? Because the Bible could say that it's the word of God, but that could mean what was written thousands of years ago. And how do we know that what we're actually reading, when we just went through 1 Corinthians and we said, Paul said this, and, he, and we spent time on words in the letter of 1 Corinthians that had significant meaning. Well, how do we know that that is right? We're reading it in English, English didn't exist then, right? Um, well, whatever. Anyway, not, not where it was written, okay? Um, and so, and so we, we kind of start peeling this stuff back, and we go, well, how do we know? And this is where we get into, like, academics, okay? And so this is where, you know, I, I want to make sure that, that what, that my goal today <laughs> is that we would all have an increased faith in God's ability and desire to preserve his word. That's, that's how we know this is authentic. Because again, it, it bases it on who God is. If, if God is going to breathe out the very words to us, to reveal himself to us, it wasn't just for a time, it was to communicate to you in your context, in your language, and so my goal today is that we will walk away from this going, yes, I believe that in fact this is the same words that Paul wrote, the same words that Moses, is, Moses wrote down, the same words that the prophet Isaiah spoke. These are the same words. Which means we're going to get into a little archaeology. <laughs> so if, you're, if, if you are like super academic and you're like, dude, I'm going to just, you're going to love this. For everybody else, I'm sorry. <laughs> I really wrestled with how, how to do this, but I, I feel like it's such a fundamental truth of the Bible that there's really no way to do this without digging in and actually spending the time walking through this. And so I'm going to try to bring it back to, um, to the gospel message as we walk through this. Because what we will see throughout this, we will see that in, in summary that Archaeological digs, everything we find continues to affirm that what we have in our hands is authentic. That's the summary. And I'm going to walk through it. I'm going to, I'm going to hopefully prove that to you guys. And hopefully, can, can you guys even see the screen? Can you? Okay. I'll try to step back. Um, so so that's, that's my goal. Um, I'm going to pray. Father. I pray that this morning would be glorifying to you, that as we dig into um, archaeology and history and all this, that um, 
that it wouldn't be a distraction, Father. That we would walk out of here um, armed with, with better understanding. Um, that we would rest in a stronger faith in knowing that you are sovereign and you have preserved your words for us. And that tells us so much about you and your power and your sovereignty. And that's what we want to dwell on today, Lord. And so we pray that that, that would point to you, glorify you, and that we would all have a stronger faith because of that. We pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So how do we know that... Um, how do we know that this is authentic? That's, that's what, again, that's what we're going to be going through. So if you go to Psalm uh, chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, we read that the psalmist says, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. And so we see from the very outset, and this is all throughout, and I'm just picking a sampling, that in fact, God intends to change us, conform us to his will through his word. And that he's going to preserve them and keep them. And we see that Jesus says the same thing as he finishes up the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse uh, 17. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. That, that phrase right there is Jesus referring to the Old Testament. Like he's, he's saying, I'm not, I'm not coming to abolish the Old Testament. He says, I have not, I'm sorry, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. How can Jesus say that? Because he's the son of God. And he says, this is what my father is going to do. We are going to preserve the law and the prophets. We're going to keep these things. And so when we go and we read the Old Testament, when we read the Torah, when we read what, what Moses wrote in the first five books, when we read the prophets, God says that he's going to keep that, that he's going to preserve them, that nothing's going to fade from it. And then further on, you, uh, as Jesus is... Um, Ascending, or just prior to it in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. How can Jesus say that? How could Jesus know that his words weren't going to pass away? He was walking around for three years talking. Nobody was writing stuff down. I mean, maybe, I mean, we, we really don't know, but he's telling parables and he's healing people and he's doing these miraculous things and he's preaching and he's doing all this. How can he say at the end of this, as he's getting ready to go back to the Father, my words will never pass away? Well, because he's the son of God and he knows what the plans of God are to preserve this. You see, so at a very basic level, before we even get into archaeology, before we even get into all of this stuff, we know that God's intent and Jesus' understanding is that not just the law and the prophets, but his very words were going to be preserved. And so when people break it down, they say, well, Jesus was just a moral teacher, and over the years, he became Paul Bunyan, right? And he became the superman, and so then he became the son of God. Nah. <laughs> nowhere close do we see that to be true. And in fact, when we dig into the archaeology, it's going to be very clear that it's not true. And so Jesus says that his words aren't going to pass away. And then if you go to John chapter 14, verse 26. Listen to what he says about the Holy Spirit. But the helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. All of it. So how does God do this? Remember last week, we are like, how does God inspire the writers? And I said, don't know. <laughs> 
It's miraculous. We don't know. It wasn't dictation. They weren't in some trance just writing down, right? Their personalities came through. How does God preserve his word? I don't know. But what he says is that the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of each of us is going to cause us to remember all things that Jesus said. Do you believe that? That's what he says. So the Father has said, hey, this, my words are pure words, and they're going to stay forever. The Son says, hey, my words are going to last forever. And then at the end, Jesus says, hey, the Holy Spirit's going to make sure you remember all the words. It seems that God intends to preserve his inspired word. Would you agree? Okay. Now we're going to get into the academic to prove it, okay? So that's, that's our faith. And so honestly, we could, we could spend the whole time just establishing that, but honestly, it, wouldn't, it would be a pretty short sermon, which maybe wouldn't be bad, but that's not what we're going to do, okay? All right. So, um, so bear with me. This is the first time I've done this thing. So I'm going to try to Try to walk through this, and my lovely bride is back there clicking slides while I'm clicking different slides. So we'll see how it works. Please, but honestly, like, um, I, I really am concerned that I'm going to uh, talk too fast or skip over things or whatever. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do my best, and um, ultimately, I hope that this proves beneficial. All right. Here's what's cool. God did not decide to preserve his word by putting it behind a locked cabinet and having a, a, a human or an institution or somebody hold it. He didn't do that. For whatever reason, he didn't do that. And I, I think we'll see the good reasons why he didn't, right? Because all throughout history, we would go, do I trust those humans? Do I trust those institutions? What did he do? He let it spread like wildfire. Like people took the gospels, people took the words of God, copied it and shared it, copied it and shared it. They were excited about what God had communicated. And their excitement proved in what we see as this incredible dispersion of just copies and copies and copies and copies of the Bible. So this is a chart that nobody can read. I get it, but you can see the blue lines. Can you guys see it okay over there? All right. Um, this is the New Testament in Greek. The, the really tall line is the New Testament in all languages. And the rest of those are every other classic that we have in Greek. How many manuscripts we have of them. You can see it's not even close. And, and what does this communicate? This communicates excitement. <laughs> Homer's Iliad was good. People weren't excited about it, <laughs> right? Why? Because, well, it didn't have eternal consequence. It makes sense that people would do this, right? Um, but it's, it's incredible what we end up seeing is that it doesn't even, it, nothing even compares to the amount. In fact, I'll just read it. It's like 23,986 in all languages, 5,856 in Greek. It's insane the amount of manuscripts that we, these are just the ones we found. In fact, there's like, sand and copies that are sitting in the bottom of museums that we just, in buckets, that we still haven't gone through. And it's, it's just a matter of like diving through this stuff. And it turns out the sand in the Middle East is great for preserving papyrus. And so we pull this stuff out and it's like, okay. And it takes them years to unroll these things, unfold them. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. So here's the other cool part. God in his sovereignty didn't just allow it to, to be spread wildly. He did it at a time that was perfect. And, and we've talked about this before, but like the Romans built roads. Paul used those roads. Peter used those roads, right? Like if, if it had just been 300 years earlier when Jesus came, it would have been hard for it to spread the way that it did. I mean, think of it as basically the equivalent of, of pushing something out when the internet came out, right? Like, you could, before the internet, you're like, man, this is going to go like wildfire, right? And we see this all the time, right? Uh, before the internet, it, would, it takes a lot longer for things to build momentum. And so the roads were significant. Not only that, but the language was significant. Uh -oh. The language was significant. This is Greek. 
Not only is it Greek, it's called Koine Greek. It's a common Greek. It's not like classical Greek. It's totally different. In fact, for centuries, scholars had no idea what these words were. They didn't even understand the, the, the idea of it wasn't what Homer wrote in. It wasn't what these other scholars wrote in. It was like this weird random Greek that they had never really seen. And so they really didn't spend a lot of time looking at it because they were like, they actually, some people thought that it was like a Holy Ghost-like language because they just didn't even know what it was. But here's the significance. Is all this blue, they all spoke the same language, or at least they were familiar with it. The light blue was familiarity. The dark blue was like, they, they no kidding spoke it. And so what did, what did the writers of the New Testament, as Paul's carrying this stuff around, he's carrying this around in Greek. He's speaking Greek, and so he could go to Rome. He could go to North Africa. He could go to Alexandria. He could go to all these different places, and people understood what he was saying. That's huge. The timing couldn't have been any better. All right. Am I too academic so far? <laughs> All right, so there, there's three things that we look at. Um, uh, format, font, and fabrication. How, how these, when we, when we actually look at these as they discover, we, I'm saying we, it's not me. I've never even looked up, I mean, I've looked at them in the, behind a glass case, but never in person, right? Um, so the format. So they wrote it on papyrus. That's like reeds. Um, you guys are familiar with papyrus, and they were uh, in scrolls primarily. Um, at, they, they shifted from scrolls to books in the first century. In fact, the church actually was the one that did it first, uh, that basically started the idea of a book. And the oldest book that we have, we'll actually see a picture of it. It's in first century, it's dated to first century. And so why? Why'd they have a book? Well, because they were taking it to church. Scrolls were unwieldy. And so they wanted a book that sat here somewhere, right? And they read from the codex, which is what it was called. It's a book. And so it was papyrus chopped up, laid flat, you know, bound, whatever. So that's the, that's the format. The font, they look at how they're written. Like, has anybody here, like, read the Constitution, like, in its original script? You guys know, like, like I actually did a little bit of search on this, but, like, nobody writes like that now, right? Like, they have Fs in the place of Ss, which, you know, you're reading and you're like, what is going on here? So what could you tell if you found something that looked like that? You go, oh, well, that's probably from the 18th century in America. If you saw my writing, you would think it's hieroglyphics. But, you know, like, <laughs> but, right, you can tell when, and this is called paleography, and this is the primary means of dating of all archaeological things, not just biblical stuff. This is how they, they did it. They also use carbon-14, but you got to burn it in order to date it. <laughs> Not super excited about burning, you know, fragments of manuscripts, especially when some of them are about yay big, right? Um, so that's the font. And then fabrication. They would do it on papyrus for a while, and then they swap to animal skin, which is vellum or parchment, okay? So what we find is that the papyrus lasted great down in the Middle East, but when it went up to Europe, in the wet Europe, it, it fell apart, molded. And so what they started doing is copying it. In the ninth century, they started doing a huge amount of copying onto animal skin, uh, which lasted uh, a lot longer. So, um, so that, those are the things that we're talking about. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that stuff. I could spend forever on it. But um, anyway, so, so that's how they date them. Okay, so I'm going to start going through some stuff that we, they go, these dates, like you can Wikipedia this stuff. This isn't like just the people that are Christians trying to make it look one way. Like, this is, this is um, across the board when we start walking through uh, some of these things. All right. Old Testament first. Am I doing okay? You guys following? Is this too academic? All right. All right. It doesn't matter, actually. Because uh, I'm going. Uh, all right. All right. So the Old Testament, okay? How do we know that this is the real Old Testament? So the, the Jews actually have two copies of uh, their oldest version of uh, the Old Testament. Um, uh, the first one is the Aleppo Codex. So this was actually uh, stored in Aleppo in Syria. Uh, there was a huge revolt in 1947, and some of it got burned, uh, but they still have a, a good portion of it. Up until 1947, this was the oldest um, codex of the Old Testament in Hebrew that had been preserved, okay? Okay. Um, 
this is what the Jews go to, to go like this is what is included. They obviously don't call it the Old Testament. They call it the Tanakh. Um, but like this is, this is what uh, they would reference. And so you see it's a, it looks just like a book. It's in Hebrew. Um, it's written by the Masoretes. Okay? If, in fact, for most of you, if you look in your Bible, somewhere down the bottom, and you can probably just turn to a page, if you have footnotes or if you have a little you know, superscript, it'll say Masoretic text. Have you guys seen that? before in your Bible, that's what, this is what it's referring to. It's saying we got this from here, it, which is different than some other sources, okay? And we'll, we'll talk through that stuff, all right? So, so this is the Aleppo Codex. The other one is the Leningrad Codex. Um, so again, same thing. It's in Hebrew. This one was in 1008. The other one was in 920 AD. So we're talking 1,000 years old. And you go, okay, well, that's good. That's still not, like Moses wrote this in like 1500 BC. So we're still 2,500 years off, right? And so you go, well, how do we know? Well, here's what we do know. Um, Judaism was very, they, they were very strict on their scribes and how they communicated these things. Here's the super cool part. Hebrew, original Hebrew, actually, I, I think Hebrew right now, um, doesn't have vowels. It's just consonants. And the, the punctuation marks tell you whether it goes up or down. Arabic's actually the same way, I believe. Um, and so your inflection, your vowels are by, punctu or by uh, accent marks and pronunciation markings and stuff like that. Well, prior to the Masoretes, that was just handed down from scribes and rabbis and schools. And they were like, this is how you pronounce this. And we could talk a whole lot about the name Jehovah and, and why there's a debate as to how to pronounce that is because people didn't want to pronounce it wrong because it was God's name. Right, and so there was a lot of caution taken in that. So they would they would hold this, and so they they would they would uh, you had to be part of like the schooling or the rabbis and and copying this stuff down. Well, the Masoretes went, I, we want everybody to be able to pronounce this stuff, and so they started making markings, a pronunciation system, and they'd mark in the margins. That's what all this stuff is in the margins. This is how you pronounce this. This is how you say this. It's pretty cool. It's actually really cool because this is the first example where we start to see that there's a desire for the people to read this. It's not just exclusive to certain populations or scholarly types of people, which is why we all have Bibles and we have the Bible app, and, you know, and, and we'll see this throughout. But it's just gone bigger and more and more and more, and God goes, I got this. I'm going to preserve this. Okay? All right, so these are the two, and the Leningrad Codex now is 100% complete. So this is the oldest version of the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, if you will. So now we have a question. Are these right? How do, we, how do we know that the Hebrew written here, by the way, this is primarily where you have your Old Testament text from. I mean, this is almost entirely where it's from. So how do you know that that is correct? This is the oldest piece of fragment of archaeology we have of the Old Testament. It's from the 6th century B.C. It's called the Kedef Hanam Silver Scroll. It's a little amulet. It's four inches by one inch, and it was rolled up, in, and it's marked on silver, and people carried it with them. And it's got numbers, uh, chapter 6, 24 through 26. Let's, uh, let me read that real quick. And if you look at this in your Bible, it probably has like a little indention. This was, this was a common expression. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. It's a blessing. And so people held this, who, who, whoever's this was, they held it close to their body. They carried it with them. It was like a little thing that they had to remember who got it. So this wasn't just scholarly like, hey, these are just words. These were personal. There was, there was a spirituality to this. There was a faith applied to these verses. And so we see this very early. Like, and guess what this matches? The same thing that your Bible says. The same thing I just read. Right? It's, it's, it's the same truth. Now, there's going to be words that are off, okay? So if any of you know a second language or have done Spanish or whatever, you know that there's synonyms, right? Like when you go from language to language, you could say different things in different ways. 
It doesn't make it wrong. Conceptually, you're still communicating the same truths. And so, and we'll spend more on that uh, in, future, uh, in a future sermon. All right, so that's, that's the no kidding oldest one. So that's 600 BC. So timing of that, this was um, just prior uh, or during the Babylonian exile. Uh, so that happened in uh, 587 BC. So when we read of the Jews being carried off to Babylon, that's when this thing was. So it's actually the same time like Jeremiah's writing, like actually writing his. We have a piece of Numbers, which Moses wrote in 1500 BC. So now we're only 900 years from when Moses actually wrote this. There's also a Nash papyrus. So this is another one. This is about 100 BC. And this is, no kidding, this is what it looks like. And they, and they read from it, and it's, it's the Ten Commandments from both Exodus and Deuteronomy, and it has the Shema, which is the hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, right? Like that, th- those, I mean, if there was something that you were going to carry with you, right, or make sure that you had, it would be that. And so this is, this is profound. And here's what's super cool about this, and this is where you start getting into some of the sovereignty of God. What we have, I mean, this isn't a lot, right? This is, this is a, I don't have, some of these have sizes on it, but. This is about that big. It's not that big. It could have been, I don't know, it could have been the not amazing stuff, right? Like, I mean, obviously God's word is amazing through and through. But there's some stuff that you're like, oh, okay. That's like the son of this, the son of this, the son of this, right? Like, if that was our scrap, it'd be like, oh, okay, well, it's good. But how cool is it that it's the Ten Commandments and the Shema from Deuteronomy 6.4? Like, this is where you start getting into that. And this is just people in buckets, in sand, digging stuff up and going, look at what we got. I see God's providence in this, and I hope you guys do too as we walk through this. So here's what's super cool. So, so there's that. And then in 1946, we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. You guys probably all heard of this, right? So the Dead Sea Scrolls, like, this is from like the 3rd to the 1st century C, uh, uh, AD, right? No, sorry, 100, 100 BC. Um, these were found in the caves in Qumran. It's like just east of Jerusalem towards the Dead Sea, and like that's the cave, right? And so they stumble upon this stuff, and they find in these vessels, like this was a community called the Essenes that had like left Jerusalem in the midst of when Roman persecution was pretty high, okay? Um, and so they left, and they were like this little monastic community. And they lived there, and they were, you know, like totally outside. They're in the middle of the desert, and they just studied. And, like, this is what they did. And they ate scrolls and scrolls and scrolls, 950 manuscripts. We have, like, the entire Old Testament except for Esther. And you can actually, I mean, like, these things are on display, and you can see these massive scrolls of papyrus. And so we go, this is fantastic. Let's see if the Aleppo Codex and if the Leningrad Codex, let's see if they're accurate. Guess what? They're accurate. We didn't, right? If, if, if they weren't, this would, like, we would be done. We, we would not be meeting, right? Like, if, if in 1946 they found all these scrolls and they're like, dude, none of this matches, and it's dated to 100 BC, and none of this matches the Masoretic text, the Jews would have had a huge problem on their hands, and we would have had a huge problem with our Old Testament on our hands. But instead, what we see is that it's the same. We're like, this is incredible. This is fantastic. And so what did God do? Some random community in the middle of nowhere that just kept their own stuff. They had no, no, nobody was keeping track of them. Nobody was making sure they were writing down the right things. Nobody was making sure that they had the proper stuff. I don't know why they didn't have Esther. Uh, but but they, they preserved it for us. All right. Where am I at? When the Jews came back from Babylon, it's like 450 BC, Ezra was, the, was one of the last ones to come back. And so we read in the book of Ezra, um, in chapter 7, verse 10. Um, turn over to that, would you? Jewish tradition has that Ezra is the one that compiled the Old Testament as we see it. It's called the Tanakh. Um, and we can go through that later, but it says in verse 10, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. And so as, as Ezra came back 
He was like, let's collect all these things. Let's put these things together. Let's make sure we understand, right? They just got back from 100 plus years in Babylonian exile. Like, they wanted to make sure that they had everything. And so uh, this is um, Zerubbabel was the priest, and then Nehemiah builds the walls, and, and Ezra comes back and starts instituting all these things, and they start reading from them, and this is it. This is 450 B.C. when they were doing all of this stuff, okay? Well, guess what? We have 100 years after that, they start translating it into Greek. Koine Greek, the same Greek I was talking about before. Why? Well, because now you're at 350 BC, and this is what everybody's starting to speak. And they go, what? What do we want to do? Let's translate this so that everybody can read it, because not everybody could read Hebrew anymore. So they translate it to Greek, and that's called the Septuagint. It's the entire Old Testament written in Greek now. Now you've got a translation, okay? So you go from Hebrew to Greek. Well, that's certainly going to be unreliable. No. It's not unreliable. In fact, these are the fragments that we have. It's the Rylands 458 papyrus, okay? These are obviously just pieces. Here's the other cool part. Look at what they talk about in these pieces. Again, it could have been obscure kind of reference type stuff, but it's not. It's like, it's commands in Deuteronomy 23. It's, it's about justice and punishment. It's about the tithing. It's about Israel being chosen people. It's about the consequence of disobedience, how bad idolatry is, and the blessings of obedience. Well, that pretty much wraps up the Old Testament, right? I mean, and this is the, the feel. These are just the pieces we have. And what do we see? It's the same. You could, you could look up each one of these things, and you're going to read, and you're going to be like, yeah, yeah, that's what it says. It might not be exactly word for word, but it's, it's exactly what it says. The context, the theological truth, what God wants to communicate through it is going to be the same. It's beautiful. And so what this looks like, so we're going to zoom in on, on uh, the D piece right up here. Um, so this is how this looks. So we don't have the whole verses. We just have parts of it. But if you read it, you know, you're reading this red part, and they go, where is this? What piece of manuscript is this? And they go, oh, that's Deuteronomy 26, 17 through 19. And so they, they don't have these words, and they don't have these words, but they have the red. And so they go, oh, this is fantastic. So what do we do? What do we read to that? And it's, and it's the same that we have. And we go, this is, this is incredible. This is fantastic. In fact, we're going to read Deuteronomy 26. Um, because again, you read this and you're like, what a cool piece of scripture for us to have. Verse seven, uh, Deuteronomy 26, verse 17. You have declared today that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes and his commandments and his rules and will obey his voice. And the Lord has declared today that you are a people for his treasured possession as he has promised you and that you are to keep all his commandments. Dude, that's a pretty, <laughs> this is a pretty good verse for us to have. And we go, well, that's a true verse. I mean, if you just went through your Bible and you're like, there's archaeological evidence for this one and this one and this one, you're going to go, yeah. The truth is there. Moreover, it tells us that God is preserving this. These are old artifacts that we have. This is before Jesus came. This is before, right, like the Catholic Church, right? And then this is the big thing that I want to bring down out of this today. So most of what we're going to talk about is before the Council of Nicaea and Constantine and the whole manipulation theory that like what we're reading is just what the Catholic Church put together or that Constantine wanted to do to, to rule over other people. It, it's totally bogus. It, science says it's bogus. Archaeology says it's bogus. And so this is beautiful as we start walking through these things. All right. That's all I have for the Old Testament. All right, so this, this gives us some good confidence that what we're reading in the Old Testament is legit. Okay, so now we go to the New Testament. Well, now we're sitting here in, uh, you know, these, the authors of the New Testament are writing, the gospel writers, I mean, 60 to about 110 AD is about when the, the time frame is. So we're, we're good. We're about 1,500 years newer than what Moses wrote. Um, but they're still writing on papyrus, and then they just started putting these things into co codexes. And so we start to get a little bit more uh, manuscript evidence uh, for these. And I will share with you guys, there are some phenomenal websites. I'm trying to convince my wife to buy me one of these things for, for uh, Christmas for my birthday. Because it's amazing. It's, like these things exist. Like legit exist. Not, she's not buying me that. Well, I don't know what she's going to buy me. But uh, 
it's not the actual papyrus, obviously. It's like uh, uh, facsimiles of it and put into a book. And it's like, it's, anyway. All right. Um, all right, so here's what we have. Um, what you have here in the New Testament, um, I'm, I'm gonna, I hope I'm going to teach this all right. Um, so you have the Latin Vulgate. You guys have probably heard of the Latin Vulgate, okay? Um, so this is Jerome. Jerome wrote this in the 5th century. We have an 8th century copy of this thing. It's a big book. Could you imagine having to haul that to church? Um, and he was commissioned by the Pope to write it. And so he wrote it, and, it was, and it's in Latin, right? And so what does he take? He takes the, the Septuagint, and he takes the Greek text, and he translates it into Latin. Why? Latin was what everybody spoke. It was the common vernacular. So once again, we see this, like, this movement to like, the common people's language. And so that's what they did. They translate it because people are like, nobody knows Greek. We need to turn this into Latin, and so they do. And so this is what Jerome writes. And then uh, John Wycliffe, he translates it to English. He paid the price for that one. He got, right, like you could not translate this into English. Um, the church had kind of held the Latin Vulgate, and at this point in the 16th century, 16th, 15th century, in the 15th century, Latin had become the church's language. Okay, now we're starting to get into a little bit of this, like, an institution's protecting this thing. And John Wycliffe goes, no, let's put this into English. Um, he got excommunicated from the church, and it was bad, bad, bad. But this was the foundation of the Protestant Reformation. Really, when we start looking at that, that we can go back and start reading this stuff. And so, so he translates it into English, and that's about what it looked like. Then you have Erasmus, who's right after this, and Erasmus really did this foundational thing. He went, you know what, I'm not going to start with the Latin and translate it to English. He's like, I'm going to go, I'm go back to the Greek manuscripts because he started questioning whether the Catholic Church was, was really, the, the Latin Vulgate was, was right. And so he goes back and he goes, let me go find Greek manuscripts. And he finds five Greek manuscripts. Where he didn't have in the Greek, he grabbed the Latin Vulgate, he put them all together, and we get the Textus Receptus, Okay. Um, this, Erasmus's version of this is what basically was the foundation of every Bible until the 19th century, and it continues to be the basis for the King James Version, okay? Now, anybody in here read King James? It's okay. It's all right. You raise your hand. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. Um, um, if you read the King James... If you can get through the, the language barrier, right, that still exists a little bit, theologically, it's no different than the ESV or the NIV. And we'll talk more translations on another sermon, but it, it's, it's, it's the same stuff. And so, so we read this, and I'll, I'll get to this here in a second. So this is predominantly what is current day King James Version is using basically this and updated versions of this. Okay, now let's, let's, let's break from that. So that's one stream, and that's how we got that. Well, there's still Greek manuscripts out there, right? It didn't just run down the Latin side. There's still Greek manuscripts that archaeology has uh, discovered. And in fact, some have been housed for a while. So Codex Vaticanus. This thing was first mentioned in the Vatican Library in like 1470 or something like that. And they, as they were listing off their books, and they're like, yeah, we have this codex, and it's called Codex Vaticanus, because it's in the Vatican. Um, it's a 4th century AD version of the Bible, and it's the Septuagint, remember, the Greek Old Testament, and everything else in Greek. And they go, okay, here's, here's, the, here's the codex, and here's, here's the Greek. And then there's a uh, Codex Sinaiticus, same thing. This one was found in uh, a monastery down in uh, the Sinai Peninsula. And they go, okay, how does this compare to Codex Vaticanus? Pretty much the same thing. Again, there's some, there's some scribal differences and stuff like that, but again, it's the same fundamental thing. This was discovered in 1844 down there. And then you have Codex Alexandrius. So these are the three main codices. This one's 5th century AD. This was gifted to the church. And so you have these three Greek texts from the 5th and the 4th century. These are the oldest, complete Bibles that we have. You go, okay. Well, what do they, how do they compare to what we read? There's, there's some... Uh, there's a word that's called textual criticism, where it's like you, you dive in and you look at this and you look at this and you try to figure out which one's the most reliable. Some people don't like that idea. Some people 
get a little squirmish because they're like, well, how do you know? How do you, how do you know that, that what you're re, you know, which one is, is right? And honestly, it's, it's scholarly at this point. It's, it's archaeology, and then we find other pieces of papyrus that support one versus the other. And so you'll read in the bottom of your Bible, this came from the Dead Sea Scrolls. This was from the Masoretic text, if you're in the Hebrew. If you're in the Greek, you might even see that it'll reference some of these codices, depending on the Bible that you have. And it'll say, hey, this Bible actually has this. In fact, if you read the, um, the long ending of Mark, or um, in John, uh, when Jesus is talking to the woman caught in adultery, there's brackets in there. Have you guys noticed this before? And like your Bibles, and in the bottom it'll say, this isn't included in some of the earliest manuscripts. And, but we'll keep it in there because it's like, I don't know. Nobody wants to remove what could possibly be the words of God. And so you have the genuineness of, of like going, we don't know. Those are honestly, those are the two biggest uh, omissions in some of them where it's like, we just don't know which one is right. And so this is where they're getting some of that stuff. But it's not there, right? It's not just that. We have archaeology now, okay? P52, just papyrus, just the name, it's how they do it, okay? This thing is dated to like between 100 and 150 AD. This is the, this is the gospel of John, John wrote his gospel around 80 to 90. This is, this is pretty legit. This is a good chunk of manuscript for us to have, and it's 18, 31 through 33. So we're going to read through this again to kind of go, man, if there's, if there's a piece of Scripture that we'd want, in fact, and then this is the back of it, so it's written on both uh, sides of this papyrus. So eight, uh, John 18, 31, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is true? <laughs> like, you guys get, like, this is the piece that God uh, allowed us to have. Now, we are blessed in that we live in the 21st century, and, and we're post-archaeology where we've discovered these things, but if, if nothing else, you got to wrestle that one, you, right? You could get rid of, if, you, if you're, you know, secular friends or people who don't believe the Bible are like, yeah, I don't believe any of it. It's like, well, you have to believe that. You have to. <laughs> like, there's nothing, you can't get any older than that short of John actually writing in front of you. And then check this one out. This is piece of, this is one I don't, hint. Um, so <laughs> this, is, this is the entire gospel of John. There's like a couple verses missing here and there because they're just like missed sheets or whatever. But it's almost the entire gospel of John is P66. We have it. From 200 AD. And guess what? It says the same thing that P52 said. And guess what? It says the same thing that Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and Alexandrius. And it says the same thing that your Bible says. Like, how amazing is this? And of all the Gospels, I'm like, yeah, I kind of like John the best, you know? <laughs> like, I mean, this is incredible. Then we have P98. This one right here. It's actually the earliest version or the earliest manuscript evidence we have of Revelation. The book of Revelation, right? This is 100 to 200 AD. Revelation was one of the last ones written. Like this is, this is like John on his deathbed, right? Like, and so this is what we get. Let's read that one. Revelation is 1, 13 through 20. Again, this, these are just incredible. It says, and in the midst of the lamp stands one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, white wool like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. 
In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And the living one, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. It's a pretty good verse. (laughs) This is our sovereign God keeping track of all of these things, right? Reassuring us and pointing us to these. And then then we have P45. This one's super cool. So this is all four Gospels and the Acts Acts of the Apostles together in one papyrus. This starts to tell us they were forming the Bible, right? Because if you find the Gospel of John here, and then you find the Gospel of Mark over here, and you find a letter here, that's something. That just means that they were obviously seen as Scripture. But when you put them together, that means people were talking about them together. (laughs) That means that they're going from Luke to Acts. And it's in a codex, right? And so they're actually starting to form the Bible. Guess what this is before? Constantine and his people and the Catholic Church, right? Like this is well before all of that. And so we start to see these things being formed. And then in P46, we see the Pauline epistles doing the same thing. Look at the letters of Paul, Romans, Hebrews, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, and 1 Thessalonians, all in one book. And the only reason we don't have 2 Thessalonians is because we're missing like the outside pages. Like, so again, they were taking Paul's letters together as one entity and going, Let, let's go through this, let's dig through this. This is beautiful, this tells us so much. It tells us that the Bible was not an institution that put this thing together. People were recognizing it. And we're going to talk about that when we get into the authority of Scripture, how this thing got put together. But it was recognized as authoritative. It was recognized very early on in the church. All right. So what do we conclude out of all this? We have 5,800 Greek. We have 10,000 Latin, like 9,300 manuscript from other languages of the New Testament. Like, we, we don't find any conflicts. We don't. And, and it, I would encourage you, go. Go, like, go Google. You have, like, the world of your feet. I will, I will share some websites that are just absolutely phenomenal. There's one that's it's not very, like, uh, appealing to the eye, but it's just a chart of all of, the, uh, all of the papyrus that we have and what dates, and you can go, and a lot of these museums have them online now, and you can click through them. You can even see translations of them, and it's like, it's beautiful. If, you, if you're wrestling with a doubt of, like, is this really the inspired word of God or was this manipulated, there is no doubt. Scientifically, there is no doubt. There's changes. There's modifications. In fact, I went to one website and it's like, this is ridiculous. There's 40,000 contradictions in the Bible. There's 40,000 variations between the different codices. And you read them and you're like, Dude, like this doesn't mean anything. And I'll, I'll give you a little a bit of an example. And I, I was watching a video that was talking about this. Like, if you were to read... Um, so these scribes, some of these scribes were very learned, especially the Jewish ones. But as we started getting into uh, the newer dates, it was, these people were just employed. They were actually not very well-educated people. And so they would just sit there, and they were just like legitimately, they didn't understand really what they were writing. They were just copying. And so they had rules. And the rules were the first word had to be the first word on the page, and the last word had to be the last word, and the middle word had to be the middle word. That's how they copied. So what does that tell you? They aren't copying thought for thought and just making sure that they're, they're trying to create a picture, another picture of it, right? And so they'll say, they'll write, they'll just be writing letters and, and things trying to make sure it fit. And so like you could, you could correlate it to like, uh, in order to, po- instead of like saying, uh, in order to form a more perfect union, it would say in order to form a more perfect onion, right? Like, like if we all read that, we would go like, oh, well, okay. Like we know what they were trying to say. That's, that's, honestly, that's a lot of them. And it's synonyms. It's like, oh, you could have picked that word or for this word. There's really nothing of theological significance. Don't take my word for it. Go look at it. Because as you watch this stuff and you read this stuff, it's absolutely incredible. 
And all it's going to do is affirm your faith. So you go and watch the uh, History Channel or the Discovery Channel, you're like, ah, that makes me nervous. And then go do your research. Don't, let, don't sit with that nervousness. Don't sit with that doubt because there is so much ample evidence sitting before us. And God used different regions. He used, right, he used Alexandria and Egypt all the, way, uh, all the way up into Rome and all around as you saw the Greek uh, speaking areas. He used all these different places and people. We didn't even talk about the stuff like that went to the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Peshitta and like the uh, Syriac language that honestly they've preserved theirs really well. Uh, and you can get a copy of that. I think the oldest copy we have of that is like in the 5th century. And, and it's like, these things are all over the place. God allowed it to go like wildfire. Why? He's like, I got it. I'm sovereign. I'll make sure that they got it. I'll make sure that it's preserved. I'll make sure that it's authentic. Okay. I never thought this thought until this week. And I was reading something and it was like, oh. so a lot of times people think about like, it's manipulated. It's a translation of a translation. You can tell that it's definitely not a translation of a translation, right? Like when, when I didn't really talk to this, I'm sorry, but you know when we were talking about the Latin version and how that got to us? Well, now what you're reading in the New Testament is going back to all of the original Greek uh, texts. Like that's how you get the New Testament. It's going straight from the Greek uh, to us. So there's no like, it's not going through Latin anymore. We're not looking at Erasmus's 15th century thing. It's, it's going straight from the Greek text now. Um, Nestle Allen is the, are the, the people that, that put together the, the, the most modern Greek version of it. Um, but here's what's amazing. You could not manipulate the text. You could not. It's not like, well, they're good Christians, and they probably didn't manipulate the text. You could not manipulate the text. These manuscripts... Scholars believe that they lasted like 100 to 200 years. And so when we're finding these fragments in 150 and 200 and a codex, guess what was still around? The, the, the versions prior, right? It wasn't like you had one that was going and then this one got copied and that one got thrown in the trash. And then you ran with this one. And then that one got copied. That one got thrown in the trash. No, it, they, it just it did this. Right? It, like, there's all these different versions of it. And so you, you could go back and look. In fact, uh, Tertullian was this Christian author, and he writes this book uh, called Prescription Against Heresy uh, or Heretics. And he's like telling them why they're heretics. <laughs> and look at what he says Come now, you who would indulge a better curiosity, if you would apply it to the business of your salvation, run over the apost apostolic churches in which the very thrones of the apostles are still preeminent in their places in which their own authentic writings are read. And then he tells them, he's like, go to Corinth. Go to Ephesus. Go, go to the churches that Paul wrote these letters, and you can read them. He's writing, he died in 220 AD. So he's telling people, like, don't take my word for this. You, this isn't, you can't just go off of this. Go to the churches where they wrote the letters, and you can read what they actually wrote. And so this is how we get the Bible, and this is how we can look at it and go, man, this is beautiful. This is absolutely beautiful, and it's founded on God's inspired word, God's character that he wants us to know him and that he intends to preserve it. And so we can look at this and go, this is authentic. And we're going we're gonna to spend some time in, in, uh, in the future looking through, like I said, the, the canon, how it got built, and the books that aren't in here and stuff like this. But but what you're going to find is that all those things that aren't in here, these were all like 300, 400 A.D., a lot later types of uh, versions. And, and again, we'll, we'll walk through it. But I hope, I, I, I know this was super academic. I hope this was beneficial. I, I hope that it at least teases your, your brain to go, man, actually, there's really good reason for my faith to be in the authenticity of the Bible. Let me pray.